Sean Ross is a prisoner. If Texas has its way, he'll be dead within the hour. This is Execution Watch. Huntsville, Texas, death penalty capital of the Western world, where Texas is preparing to put Ross to death by injecting him with a deliberate drug overdose. During the next hour, KPFT's Execution Watch will provide live coverage and commentary on the killing in Texas, the state responsible for more than a third of all U.S. executions. Execution Watch host Ray Hill, legal analyst Jim Skelton, with criminal defense attorneys Susan Ashley, Larry Douglas, Mike Gillespie, and Jack Lee. Huntsville reporter outside the death house Gloria Rubeck, Houston vigil reporter Dave Atwood. Tonight's featured interview is out of the ordinary. It's a conversation Execution Watch taped recently with the condemned man, Vaughn Ross. It will air unedited, and in its entirety. The execution watch for Vaughn Ross begins. Good evening, it's July the 18th, 2013. My name is Ray Hill. The name of the show is Execution Watch. We do not do this show regularly. We only do this show when Texas is executing someone. We do it far more frequently than we want to, but we only do it during an execution. The person being executed tonight is Vaughn Ross. I believe we have a first reporter from the field. Professor, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We have Professor Dennis Longmire of the Sam Houston University Criminal Justice School. What's going on in Huntsville, Professor? Well, Huntsville is actively engaging in the execution process one more time. The witnesses for the media walked in just before I got your call, and there are about eight or ten of us on the corner uh, waiting for the witnesses for the family for the for um, tonight's victim to proceed in. And as you well know, all of this witness walking is just the only sign that we on the corner have that tells us that the execution is going forward. We don't even know at this point whether there are witnesses for Mr. Vaughn, Vaughn Ross, do we? I don't know whether Mr. Ross has any witnesses at all. I know, I know really very little about the particular case. I, as you know, I come to these executions in opposition to all of them and try to stand in the face of what I consider to be an act of injustice. Uh, every opportunity that the state gives me. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of opportunity these days. Sometimes the uh, witnesses, uh, for, for, well, the witnesses for the uh, uh, victims in the case would come in through another entrance, and uh, Professor Longmire would not see those at all. Uh, so from this side of the uh, walls unit, the witnesses for the media and uh, the witnesses for the family of the person being executed would come in. Sometimes that is only one group, sometimes that is two group. Uh, but it tells us that the process has begun. That's correct. And the reason that they began bringing the witnesses for the victims into the administration unit before anybody arrives at the corner is because there were some, um, some of the protesters would bring a megaphone and they would begin chanting, the governor is a serial murderer and tonight we're carrying out a homicide. And the prison system felt that that was perhaps going to be a bit insensitive and very difficult for the family members of the victims to, uh, to experience. And so they took every effort they could to protect them from that kind of, um, of an experience. I understand it. Uh, but they do now, and it's been at least 10 years, I believe, that they've been bringing the family members of the victims into the prison well before 5 o'clock. I always get here at 5 o'clock or shortly before, and in many, many years I have not seen family members of the victims. Okay. Uh, how many vigilants are there? Let's see, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, about 14 of us, 15, 16, 17. There are almost 20 of us. What is the mix? Are any local folks, any European folks? Yep, there are local folks and Euro European folks. There is a film crew from um, um, 
Germany, who's here, they've been doing it. They, they came, I think, principally because of yesterday's execution and the affiliation with the German country. Yesterday we executed John Quintanilla, who had married a woman from Germany while he was on death row. And she's that was here Tuesday, as well. yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, she's there? She is here as well. She, interestingly, in Texas, if a person dies and it's not a natural death, it's not by natural causes, and a, the person's body cannot be cremated until 48 hours pass. Uh -huh. So since her husband did not die from a natural cause, she has to wait here two more days before she can have his body cremated so she can bring it home with her to Germany, where she will... And in, te stay. in Texas, uh, uh, Professor, bodies are property, and if there is not someone who has married them or a family member to claim them... They are inherently buried in the John Bird Cemetery, referred to as Peckerwood Hill by Texas inmates, which is the inmate indigent cemetery. That's correct. Listen, uh, Dennis, will you get in touch with us as soon as something else happens? Yes, I will. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye. And so now we shift over to Dave Atwood. Dave, where are you and what's going on there? Uh, Ray, we're at the corner of uh, West Alabama and Woodhead, outside of uh, on the street by Saint uh, um, Stevens Stevens Church, and we've got a uh, a good turnout. We've got about uh, twelve people here. Um, as as usual, a lot of traffic going by. Uh, we've got it's mostly the people that are normally here, but we have. Some other people that are here, like uh, Sissy Farenthold, came out with us today. And, oh, wonderful. Uh, and uh, it's really great. And uh, I just want to mention one thing. I just wonder how many people that have been executed in Texas have ended up in Germany, buried in Germany, because I know there's a fellow from Germany, a guy named Karl Rodenberg, who visits prisoners on Texas death row and has... Uh, I know he's brought back at least one person, uh, the remains of one person to Germany, uh, maybe two. Uh, and uh, so it's like, uh, it's too bad these people can't visit Germany, you know, before they die. Uh, but uh, there, are a lot of, there is a lot of interest in what goes on here from people in Germany, as well as France and other European countries. Well, so to so many of us, uh, people around the world, Texas' uh, uh, um, bizarre practice of execution is worthy of their political attention. And so we attract people who are just kind of coming over here in disbelief. The yeah. burial of people, the, the claiming of bodies and the burial of people, even our producer Elizabeth Stein once wrote a play uh, on that theme. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, they just recently had the, the World Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty had their uh, annual meeting in Madrid, Spain. Uh, there were uh, uh, several people, I think, from Texas that went over. I didn't go, but there were a number that did go over. And there is such a strong international uh, uh, movement against the death penalty. A lot of people here, of course, in Texas don't, under don't realize that. They think everybody does what Texas does. Uh, we know that's not the case, thank God. And uh, But... Uh, uh, there is a real strong international movement against the death penalty. And I think the numbers right now, there's over 140 countries that have uh, abolished the death penalty, either by law or by practice. And, and there's usually two or three more countries every year that's added to that number. So, um, Dave, if, if folks want to get involved in the movement to end executions, how do they reach your group? Well, the best way, again, is our website, which is uh, tcadp.org, tcadp.org. That brings you to the website of the state organization, and uh, that is the best way to get. And then you can get connected with the local people in whatever uh, city you're involved in. And that is the acronym for Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. Right, right. Thank you, Dave. This, okay, proce this process has Bye -bye. begun. Bye-bye. Okay, and uh, Jim, Jim Skelton, uh, our crew of lawyers, which was announced in the billboard and be recognized within the show, Jim 
kind of runs lead road. Jim, uh, what about this case? It's been kind of what happened. Uh, this guy, Boss Ron, Boss Vaughn, was a student at Texas Tech University studying from architecture from St. Louis, Missouri. He's dating a gal named Lisa. And the events that led up to this particular killing is that the day before the, they, they found the bodies, what happened is Lisa's sister by the name of Viola called up the house several times, and there was a confrontation on the phone between Ross Vaughn and the sister. And during these numerous conversations where she called the house talking to Lisa, his sister, uh, she put on Lisa's ex-boyfriend and this enraged Ross Vaughn. He was very angry because the sister had put an ex-girlfriend on the phone, ex-boyfriend on the phone talking to his current girlfriend. Got very angry about it, and at that point, uh, the girlfriend wanted to leave the house, and he wouldn't give her a ride, and she had a four-year-old baby with her, and he wouldn't give her a ride. So she calls her sister, Viola, to come and pick her up. So what happened at this point, he still would not give her a ride to go anywhere and she started to leave and he put on some latex gloves and told her to leave. And then what happened is that he told the sister, his girlfriend, I don't want you here, but for what I'm fixing to do. And at this point, she leaves the house. She goes to a neighbor to call for some ride. Couldn't get a ride. She leaves the apartment, apartment complex. And after she leaves the apartment complex, the neighbor hears a series of gunshots. Calls the police, but apparently they found nothing. The following day, they found two bodies about four and a half miles from the apartment complex in a ravine. And inside the car that the bodies were found was a Texas Tech professor and a Biola, of course, the young lady who was a sister. The Texas Tech professor's named Bird, Douglas Birdstall. He was an associate dean at Texas Tech. Both of them had been shot in the head. He was in the back seat. Viola was in the front seat. And so the police at this point remember that earlier there had been some shot, reported shots fired. They go to the apartment complex. When they get the apartment complex, Outside of Ross Vaughn's apartment, they find two pools of blood and some shell casings, as well as some shattered glass. So at this point, they go back to the car and they find a pair part of a, of a latex glove. Because remember earlier, uh, Ross Vaughn had put on some latex gloves earlier, and they found the part of a finger of a latex glove. Later, DNA evidence indicated that blood on the latex glove belonged to Mr. Birdsall, the professor, plus inside the glove they found the DNA evidence connecting to Voss Von, Voss Ron, I mean Von Ross, I'm sorry. Then they go to Von Ross's apartment, talk to him, he gives them consent to search it, they search it, find a sweatshirt inside his apartment, there's blood on the sweatshirt that is connected to the professor who shot, so they have DNA evidence on the sweatshirt inside the apartment of Valsheron's apartment. They have Valsheron's DNA evidence inside the murder car where the murder cars were found. And so at this point, they confronted him with the evidence they had. And what he said was very bizarre. He tells the police when they confront him with the evidence, well, if whatever you got is true, then you're on the right track. And uh, never denied it. He just simply said, if what you say to me is true, then you're probably right. Didn't actually confess, but he certainly didn't deny doing the, the killing. And after they got the DNA evidence, of course, they then at that time charged him and put him in jail. And what really hurts him when he's in jail, and I thought everybody knew this, his mother came down or either called him on the telephone and they tape record all those phone calls. And his mother confronted him and asked him, did you kill those two people? And his reply was, I might have. Although this isn't what you call a specific confession, yeah, it's a specific. it certainly implies that he wasn't denying anything. And I understand even from your interview, he never denied any of this any time. So basically what it amounted to was DNA, he never confessed. The DNA evidence was connected, his DNA was connected to the car where the bodies were found. Uh, the blood of the victim was found in his house on his sweatshirt inside of his apartment. And that's basically the case. And that's, uh, uh, you get this information from the trial record? Yes. 
from the trial record. From the trial record, any significant media at the time? I imagine it's a big case. And... It's a big case primarily because you got two people killed. There are not that many killings in Lubbock, and one of them happened to be a prominent member of the community, an associate dean. Now, let me explain how the associate dean got involved in all this transaction. This is almost bizarre. What happened after Boss's, Ross's, Ross's girlfriend calls up her sister and wants her ride to come and pick her up because they're having a big argument at the house, the professor shows up with a friend of Viola, the sister's, a friend of hers. Mm-hmm. And what he does, he tells them that he was looking for a black prostitute, a young female black prostitute. And so Viola, the sister, says, well, I can find you somebody, but in the meantime, i got to go pick up my sister. you got to take her to this other business. And so he gets in the car with Viola, not knowing any of the problems that Viola had been having with Vaughn Ross, goes to the apartment and waits outside, of assuming, and he comes out, and both of them get shot in the head and killed. And obviously, from the facts of this case, when you read the opinion, uh, Von Ross never knew the professor, had no dealings with the professor. The professor just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Witness. It's really bizarre. Susan, what have you got for us? This case is very unusual compared to most capital cases. In most capital uh, death penalty cases, the uh, offender has a lot of priors and a lot of bad acts. But in this particular case, the state had very little to put on because there was really very little there. The state put on the testimony of a jailer from the county jail who testified that at roll call he removed a wristband and threw it on the floor, that the deputy wrote him up for a disciplinary, and the deputy testified he kind of went crazy, I guess, over the disciplinary. Um, Also, the state put on the testimony of a police officer from Missouri. The police officer from Missouri testified to an, uh, an offense from 1997, and this was a felony assault against a girlfriend and stealing her car. The police officer also testified that the girlfriend, who was the complainant in this case, told the police officer that he tried to stab her and took her car. Of course, the police officer testifying to what the girlfriend said would be a hearsay, would be hearsay. I guess it came in without objection, we would assume. Well, was there and a trial of that matter? No, I, we would assume that he pled guilty on that. But what what ends up happening is the police officer testifies to what the girlfriend told him. Now, the state also puts on the testimony of the probation officer that supervised that case. The probation officer testifies testifies that uh, Ross told the probation officer that the girlfriend tried to stab him and that he took the knife from her and stabbed her and took the car. Um, he also told the probation officer that she had been stalking him And the probation officer on cross-examination from the defense testified that he took anger management, completed the anger management course as part of probation, attended the counseling as part of probation, and successfully completed the probation. Uh, She also testified that he said he didn't show remorse, but he said if he would do it all over, he would just walk away. What didn't come out as far as this incident, that apparently the girlfriend from Missouri that was the complainant had an extensive criminal background, and she was really in the business of being a thief and a car thief, and she shot another boyfriend, and I I think he died from the gunshot wounds later. So she had quite an extensive history in terms of her criminal background. If she had brought that evidence in, she would have been impeachable. Well, if she had testified, the girlfriend herself, she she could have been been directly, I mean, in other words, she could have been cross-examined on any of this. And also, obviously, other witnesses could have testified as to her background and so forth. Ray, in answer to your question, whenever a police officer gets on the stand and testifies what the complainant said, you can still impeach 
with the record of the complainant, for example. Okay. Uh, when the, what happens, the police officer stands in the shoes of the girlfriend that complained. So when you get them on cross-examination, you could bring up all the bad stuff the girlfriend had done. When you talked to her, were you aware of the fact she'd been stealing cars? Were you aware of the fact she shot at her prior boyfriend? Were you aware of the fact of all of this? So even though the girlfriend didn't testify, when the police officer stood in her shoes and testified, at that point, the police officer, they could have brought up everything about the complaining witness's background through the policeman. And something else that's really important about this, and Susan had mentioned it, the girlfriend went to the doctor, but they didn't even admit her. She claimed she's all cut up. They didn't put her in the hospital, period. And they brought this out, but none of this evidence about her prior background was brought out in front of the jury. Okay. But, but uh, the, uh, you can impeach somebody who's not there. Exactly, because see what happens if you testify what I said and I'm not present, and then they get you on cross-examination. When you talk to Jim Skelton, were you aware of, you can tell all the bad things that I did, and they bring it out through you. That's exactly how it's done, because when this cop testified is what the girlfriend said, all the defense lawyer would have had to have said, were you aware of the fact when you talked to her that she was a gangbanger? Were you aware of the fact that she had been stealing cars? Were you aware of the fact she shot at her boyfriend? They could have brought out everything through the police officer, but it wasn't done in wasn't this case. It wasn't done in this case. No. Mercy. Essentially, the point here is that the girlfriend's background and history was not brought out, whether it was through the girlfriend, by, through her testifying herself, or through the police officer, or through any other witness. That was not brought out. The only way it was slightly touched on is what the probation officer said that, that Ross told the probation officer. So that offense could have been, shall we say, kind of neutralized if her background had been brought out. Um, also, then that was really it. That's really all the state had on punishment. And then the defense testimony on punishment was the defense put on three witnesses. They put on one witness, a doctor student from Texas Tech that had been a fraternity brother that knew Ross, I guess, through the fraternity. And he testified that Ross studied architecture, that he worked, he paid for his education, that he never saw Ross with a gun, a knife, that he actually never saw him get very upset or act violently. He actually described Ross as being a peacemaker and usually very calm and mild-mannered. He also testified he wasn't a drug user, that he used alcohol only socially, and that he had girlfriends. And then there was another witness, a female, who was an accountant in Dallas that at one time had been a roommate with Ross. She and another law student were roommates, I guess, for a while with Ross. And she testified that he was a diligent student, that he was not a drug user, that he wasn't a, a gangster type, that he rarely drank, um, that he had a girlfriend, and that they had a good, loving relationship. And she described him as meek, humble, calm, polite, and a nice man. Um, then his mother testified. Now, his mother testified that he had three sisters, that he had not seen his dad since he was eight years old, and that he went to public school, that he ran track, he played football, he was a Cub Scout, he was a Boy Scout, um, he had a job at a country club while he was in school. Um, he didn't run around with the wrong crowd. In fact, he ran around with good kids at school. Uh, he was president of his fraternity. He got an associate's degree. Um, that his, I guess, step-grandfather was a preacher. And that when he was growing up, he went to church two or three times a week. Um, the mother also testified that by the time he was in junior high, they moved to, I guess, a suburban neighborhood in St. Louis that was mostly white, and he attended a school that was kind of mixed black and white. But basically, he was uh, had a pretty good background. I mean, as far as his childhood, he was never in trouble. He had one minor curfew violation, but he was never in any serious trouble. Um, was there ever any determination where this gun came from? They never found the weapon. That's what's interesting. They never found the weapon? Or as a matter of fact, when the police first talked to him, they were trying to find the weapon. And they said something about, you know, we're worried about a, a weapon in the house. And he said, don't, if a child can find it, he says, don't worry, a child can't find it. But they never found a gun. 
and the mother also testified that growing up they had no guns in the home. Um, then the defense lawyer asked the mother if there was something she would like to tell the jury. <laughs> and that's, you could say, where it really, shall we say, goes wrong. The mother, I guess the mother was, um, shall we say, so uh, distraught that he was found guilty, that she essentially was very angry. The mother, the mother doesn't show up until punishment phase. Correct. The mother, when she's asked if she has wants ha, wants to say something to the jury or has something to say to the jury, she basically tells the jury that they did a horrible job, that they never never gave him a chance from the start, that they essentially were not open to hearing his side of the case. She was very angry with them, and she basically said that she kind of lamb blasted them for doing a terrible job. And she attributed it to that when they showed up, they were ready to convict him because he was black. Um, and then when she was asked uh, if she would like to ask the jury to give him life, she responded that no, she was not asking the jury to give him life. And then when the defense lawyers pressed her further on that, they got her to say, well, I would prefer life over death. But I think apparently the mother was just so angry at the jury for holding him guilty that when she was given a chance, she just lashed out at the jury and let him know what she thought. Okay, I'm going to interrupt at this point because... Uh, and, and that did not help. That did not help. Right. We'll have more on that later. I am going to interrupt uh, at this point because the interview on today's Execution Watch is with Vaughn Ross himself. What happens is uh, Execution Watch producer uh, <coughs> Elizabeth Stein and I and Mark Pertle go to Livingston, Texas in the visit room there, and we interview those inmates who wish to be interviewed on Execution Watch. Uh, so this is my interview with Vaughn Ross. Vaughn Ross. Uh, I know you got a date, or I wouldn't be here, because right. we don't invite to do this. You understand what we're doing here, mm -hmm. and we have your permission to record video and audio of this conversation. And um, uh, uh, our deal with you is unless you tell me otherwise, I will not give this material, share this material with anybody. Uh, without your specific permission until the execution date. Okay? Yeah. Vaughn, how did you get in this mess in the first place? <laughs> That's a long story. <laughs> okay. And where do I start or begin? Uh, well, when I decided to go back to school, mm -hmm. I enrolled at Texas Tech, so I came down here to study architecture. Uh -huh. And that's what brought me to Texas. Okay. And <laughs> the rest is pretty much history from there. Okay, so you were studying architecture at uh, Texas Tech. Right. Is it a pretty good school for architecture up there? Um, I'm not sure now because it, 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 that wasn't my first choice. It was actually my uh, second, maybe third choice. And they were the first one to accept me. So I jumped on the opportunity oh, and came yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, I got a grandniece going through college hopping right now. Yeah. She wound up at MIT, but wow, that's that, a good she, school. She don't like that because she's got to work hard for that grade. Right. <laughs> uh, so you were studying architecture. How was life? How long were you there? Uh, I was there what three years. Mm -hmm. So life was good. <laughs> to, to, it took a turn for the worse. So yeah. Apparently, when were you arrested? Uh, I was arrested on February the fourth, two thousand one. 2001. And tell me about the circumstances of the arrest. I'm not going to ask you any questions of, about whether you did what they're accusing you to do or anything. <laughs> you volunteer anything you want to, but I'm not going to ask you any questions about that. Well, the day I was arrested, a lead detective and his partner called me on the phone, told me they was outside to arrest me. So I told him, okay. I get off the phone. <laughs> 
I grab my hat, I grab my wallet, and I grab my keys, and I step outside. When I turn to lock my door, I seen like this flash on my, uh, like a black blur on my left side, and I just glanced over there to see what was going on. What I didn't know on my right side was a SWAT team <laughs> drawing down on me. <laughs> so <laughs> when they gave me orders not to move or whatever, my first instinct was to run back in the house, but I said, no, you have nothing to run for, so don't, you know. So I just <laughs> basically had to, sur and yeah, I had to basically surrender to them. But the, the key thing is that I had been talking to the, the detective before then. They came, they, they interviewed me twice. I allowed them to search my car, allowed them to search my apartment. You know, I told them, I have no problem with you uh, investigating me for this incident. But, you know, and he said that if they decide to arrest me, it was going to be him and his partner. Yeah, well, he didn't, didn't tell me nothing they, about this SWAT, about SWAT team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, they got a lot of rituals. In there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but <laughs> it's it's crazy because that same SWAT team ended up shooting and killing one of their own officers. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, okay. it, it, had I did try to run back in the house, I probably wouldn't be alive to this day. Probably not. <laughs> All right. Roll with a bunch. Of, what's home for you? Where are you coming? Uh, St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri. Right yeah. in the middle of the country. Yeah, <laughs> Midwest, as they call it. What caused you to take up architecture? Um, I don't know. I've always kind of been fascinated in, in, with, with drafting and drawing and, and things of that sort. And Well, I actually have an associate's and a bachelor's in drafting from my previous mm -hmm. university. So to progress further, that's why I went into architecture. I actually worked for a couple of architecture firms back home in St. Louis, but... Mm -hmm. Since I didn't have the actual architecture sure. degree, I couldn't do all the things whole that lot I of wanted difference to do. In money <laughs> working right. someplace and being an architect. Right. And what were you? What kind of design did you look forward to doing? Well, really, just to be able to create and design in itself is is is, is an exciting thing, you know. Especially when you can put something on paper. Well, pull an idea out of your own mind, and then make it materialize on paper, and then see it built in actuality, that in itself <laughs> is something, you know. Because I've worked on a few projects and from, you know, drafting them and then seeing the ground breaking and then having them actually built and I'm like, wow, that's something I worked on. That's something, you know, I, I was a part of. Okay, so now you're arrested and you're locked up. How did the process go for you? What is your impression of how you got representation and what is the quality of that? How did that system work for you? Uh, well, in my opinion, and, and I, I would guess most people would say that also, but it didn't work uh, very good in my opinion because there was a lot of things that I brought up to my attorney that he just didn't present to the courts, and he just let it slide by. And even during trial, a lot of things he should have objected to, he didn't. You know, they had people come to my trial I never met before identify me. They didn't identify me as the person who committed the crime. They just identified me as they knew me. And then when they testified, they talked about things that they supposedly knew of me that they heard secondhand. And I'm like, I don't know these people. I've never met them before. And how was the, and everything they're saying is a lie. So I don't get this. Was the state sharing the evidence they had with your attorney or was this? They, to, to my knowledge, that they, they did, but um, from what I'm finding out, they didn't give all the information for, as far as, uh, I think it was the raw data on the so-called DNA testing that they did. <laughs> that in itself So this is a big else. issue in your case about the quality of the DNA testing. Right, right. And the chances of its being contaminated. Right. Could well, you explain that? Well, the thing is, they try to say that uh, the sweatshirt that I was wearing the night of the, that crime, they claimed that it had a blood stain on there. There was a mixture of uh, one of the victims and my DNA. The problem of that is that the first time I allowed them to search my apartment, I gave them a list of the clothing I was wearing, and I told them what, what, it, what it was and told them they could take it. Well, when they came to my apartment and searched it, I even pointed out the clothing that I had on that day. They examined my clothing then, didn't find anything on it, left those clothing, took other clothing instead. Then it was later on that they came back. Well, they actually didn't take the clothing from my apartment. With the day I got arrested, 
I was wearing the same thing that I had on the night that that crime happened. What? And what's the difference of time there? Um, the time difference was uh, the crime happened on a Tuesday night. I was arrested on a Sunday, almost a week. Same, same week. But right. Yeah. End of the week, or going into the next week. And the thing is, uh, the night of the crime, I got pulled over by the police on the other side of town. Mm -hmm. And when the police pulled me over, he told me my back light was out. So when I got out of my car to check and see if the back light was out, what I didn't know, he was videotaping the whole incident. Uh -huh. So it showed what I was wearing that night. Okay. So when they got a hold of that video and saw that I was wearing what I said I was wearing that night, then they wanted to come back to get the clothing. Thing is this, I had him on, but at my trial, Oh, it was doing the arraignment first. At the arraignment, when they took me straight to the to be arraigned before the judge, mm -hmm. it was an officer standing behind me claiming that he see he saw stains on my clothing. Now the stain is supposed to be on the front of my shirt, and but so he's standing behind me saying that he sees stains on my clothing. Well, and I gotta ask the question. Right it's now, an awful lot of business with police here. <laughs> is that what black folks have to go through in dealing with police? You get stopped for tail lights burned out. I don't, don't want to make it a race issue or anything no, like that. No, I know you don't want to make it. You but have other minorities. You have other sure. the people who are poor, the the mentally ill, or whatever. They go through the same problems as we all do. So. I'm not, I don't want to go into that. I'm, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here saying, pulled over for a tail light. That well, maybe Houston cops are just busier than they are up in Amarillo. That's where. It no, it's it. Lubbock. Lubbock, Lubbock. Right. Up in Lubbock. Yeah. So it was after that that they confiscated my clothing from me from the county jail, uh -huh. and then, well, it was the lead detective, <laughs> same guy. He the one who confiscated my clothing from me from the county jail kept my clothes in his office for three or four days before he turned them over to another detective who then supposedly turned them over about a month later to the DPS to be tested. But none of this is listed in the chain of custody. Really? <laughs> really. <laughs> and that's, that was a big issue and a big point that I was trying to make. Hey, look at this. How is it that? Well, that, that issue alone, the, right. the, 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 the pilfering with the chain of custody, <laughs> and I would say it was quite fortuitous for you to have been stopped by a car uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, on a night that they would later accuse you of committing that, a crime. No, it wasn't later. That was this, it was the, during the same time. Now, okay. I'm supposed to be committing this crime, but I'm on the other side of town, getting pulled over by the police. Okay. How do you explain that? You know. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about me instead of talking about you, but the first time I came up here was on the Clarence Brantley case. Clarence Brantley, I think I've heard, yeah. He was case. on here for many, many, many years, and he had two dates, and he had run completely out of appeals. Mm -hmm. And then I found out on the prison show that the judge and the prosecutor had taken evidence out of the evidence box and flushed them down the uh -huh. toilet. I didn't hear about that. But I had a witness, which was the court reporter, and the evidence was examined by the DPS, and we had a report that right. showed those two items that didn't match black Clarence Brantley because he don't have no red pubic hair and he don't have no freckled skin. Right. Got it. We were able to turn his case around when it was beyond hope. <laughs> the first time I came up here, not here, it was, it was at the it was at the uh, uh, Ellis then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Word. And I went and talked to, to Clarence through the window. He was jovial, and it wasn't an interview <laughs> like this, but he was jovial, and he was a pretty good spirit. Right. Because Clarence knew he didn't do that. Right. And he had faith that he wasn't <laughs> going to meet the timely, untimely end. Uh, but I can, just our conversation around here, I can see that if you, who is your lawyer? Uh, at the current time, I have Don Fernay and Rick Wardrop. They're appeals attorneys that are mm -hmm. handling my case. Where are they from? Um, Don is from New Mexico. Okay. And Rick is from Lubbock. Okay. And and you've got confidence in them. <laughs> I mean, they got your life in their hands, don't they? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I have confidence in them, though. <laughs> but they got something to work with here. But they're not working with it. That's the whole point of it. They're not working with it. 
Are you challenging them? Are you writing these folks and saying, you know? Well, I have other people looking into my case, so. Okay. All right. <laughs> so you got a fallback. System. Yeah. Because okay. I know I, I, I'm dealing on another case with David Dow. Well, Pruitt's case with David right. Dow. And David Dow's the most overworked man I've ever seen in my, my <laughs> life. He's got way too many cases. But he can't walk away from it. Mm. There's some really wonderful people in this business. <laughs> uh, if relief comes, you're not here on any other offenses. No, no other offenses. You didn't have any other criminal record for this. Uh, was well, something of uh, assault charge back in Missouri, but nothing here in Texas. Okay, but it's, so, so. If something happens and you're out for months under this heavy weight, and you get a life back, what do you intend to do with it? <laughs> well, I'm, that's 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 a big are you question. Still, yeah. Are you still fascinated by architecture? Not like I used to be, because I've been separated from that world for a good decade now. So that's that's something that's almost behind me now. Are it's, you it's, it's always going to be a, a, a love there for it, but it, um, there's other things on my mind. If anything, it would be try to go to law school and get a law degree. <laughs> Are you encouraged by Anthony Graves and the other exonerees? Yeah, it, it was good because I remember hearing about it on the radio and the, that he got released and I was like, man, I know. I if you know were listening to KPFT, feeling. that probably came across in my voice. <laughs> Because I was the one early to break that news. Mm -hmm. Because we, we were able to get the word and get it out. When you're in the news business, you like to be the first. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I find you a perfectly likable guy. When you get out, you're welcome in my neighborhood for <laughs> damn sure. Well, I but I got a few architectural things that need tidying up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Texas would be my place of residence. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> Not from here. Don't want to be here. <laughs> Vaughn Ross, I certainly hope that this works out for you. Yeah. And uh, if you want me to share this interview, let me know. You can. Because even in the media coverage of me being arrested and being escorted to court and to jail, it shows I'm worrying what they say that they confiscated from my apartment. Now, if you confiscated these things from my apartment a days earlier, how could I be worrying them? Right. So that proves in itself that they presented false information to the court. And then the numbers of the testing in itself was no good. <laughs> so. Well, uh, is there anything else you want to say? Because we're going to close her down with your final statement. Uh, well, me getting this date in itself, <laughs> it's due to the DA's political aspirations. This is supposed to be an election year in Lubbock. He's up for re-election. So as soon as my case got kicked out of the Fifth Circuit, he ran before the judge to give me a date set. Three days later, after my case got kicked out of the Fifth, I'm on death watch. <laughs> I've never heard of anyone getting a date that fast. I mean, literally. The day they got the date, the order, I was on death watch. <laughs> and there's other guys, it took them weeks or months, three days later. Come on. Are you in communication with the other guys on watch? Yeah. You can talk to them, give them my regard. All right. And I want to thank you for this interview. Okay. That was me and Vaughn Ross. We have a call. Put the caller on the air. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, professor, this, this, this what, is, what's yeah. going on? The uh, witnesses exited the walls unit about three or four minutes ago, and so the execution has concluded. Uh, Von Ross is no longer a citizen of Texas. Von Ross was executed by the state of Texas during a tape of an interview I did with him on death row. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, you're welcome. <clears throat> good luck and have a good evening. Thank you. And uh, so... Uh, this is a fait accompli, and uh, Larry was going to pick up the discussion of Vaughn's mother, I think. Larry, what's going on there? Right, right. 
that's just where uh, Susan left off. Uh, the Vaughn Ross's mother, Johnny Ross, after having given in- information about his background, was a- asking open-ended question by the lawyer, saying, do you want to say anything else to the jury? Clearly, the lawyer was expecting her, wanting her to appeal to the jury to ask them to save her son's life. This is the punishment phase, and the issue is life or death. She went off and inserted herself right into the middle of everything, says, I want to let this jury know they did a horrible job and extreme injustice to me and my family and my son. Uh, which suggests that she considered herself to be right in the middle of everything. This is she, she's taking a direct. This is between me and you, jury. You you you've done an injustice to me and to my son and and my family and to my son. So it's son's third. Yeah. So she apparently was very intimately involved in the whole process, and it seems as though when you when you look at the facts of the case that Vaughn Ross had two lawyers, one of whom was retained, paid by the family, and then one of whom was was uh, appointed seven weeks before the trial. Uh, and why, why, why would that situation happen? Well, typically, you do have two lawyers on a capital case. Capital cases are extremely expensive. So if they've hired one lawyer, it's not unusual for the court to appoint another lawyer. Okay. But the hired lawyer would have been on the case for a well before making the trips to St. Louis, talking to the family and so forth. And in, in, in any case, we, we, we know that that, 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 cap, that, that that criminal case is in two parts. You've got the guilt and innocence, then you've got the punishment. Mm-hmm. And But you have to prepare for both of them mm-hmm. well before anything starts. There was this, this, this maneuver saying, let's, let's, let's uh, have a, uh, uh, a continuance. To allow us to develop some 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 uh, th- that that he might not be competent. Uh, well, what happened was when when the second lawyer was appointed, the the retained lawyer assigned to him the responsibility for uh, developing mitigation evidence for punishment. The mother, though, had already, uh, and I assume that Miss Johnny Ross considered because she was paying the bill. Yeah, uh, that uh, she was controlling the way information got to the retained lawyer. When he was interviewing witnesses, he had those witnesses. She had those witnesses interviewed them in in her presence. Okay, and she was controlling them and keeping them from. And she she and he, uh, Vaughn Ross, had directed the the, uh, the 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 retained lawyer not to even focus so much on mitigation. But to focus on getting him acquitted, because that was their say. Forget about the mitigation. Okay, but by the time she got on the witness stand, that was already over. It was already <clears> over. <throat> uh, but in the preparation phase, uh, I'm, I'm I, I don't know how much preparation had been done for punishment. But when 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 you're when you're preparing for punishment, and your client and his mother is just are telling you, forget about that. Don't don't prepare for that. Pre- go d- direct your efforts toward getting me acquitted, and then when the retained lawyer gets an appointed lawyer and says you work on this, and the appointed lawyer says, well, you know, I don't have a whole lot to work with because I don't have a mitigation expert or anything, and I'm I'm not going back and forth to St. Louis. Uh, it, it it seems as though somehow something has sort of gotten dropped. Uh, but in terms of of of, of Johnny Ross, it seems as though that she was orchestrating some of the matter. Uh, and I, I would suspect because I want to get came Mike back. in. Okay, Mike, uh, 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 let's let's get get in. This, this is um, <laughs> how not to do your capital murder case. Yeah, Mike was the one going to talk about the lawyer's conduct. Mike, pull your mic up. Too. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. The uh, trouble with this case is this first lawyer was hired, and as Larry just said, the lawyer was pretty much instructed by the family to concentrate on guilt or innocence. That's a problem because you have to expect it's not going to go the way you want it to go. So he did not prepare for the mitigation. <coughs> the, the mitigation. What I found interesting was your interview. That's a very intelligent-sounding man. Yeah, yeah, he, he's intelligent-sounding. I, I found him uh, evasive. I, I had to milk him some time to get sound. But he sounded like Mind somebody. He sounded like somebody who the jury should have heard. 
and I do not understand how you can try a case and not be ready for the for the downside of it. So the trouble with the attorney is I feel that he was ready to try to acquit the client but not ready to get involved with the mitigating with the mitigating evidence. So once the case was lost, it went on appeal. Well, the next problem came on on the appeal on the writ. The writ was show how the lawyer was incompetent. But the trouble with incompetent lawyers is sometimes the incompetent lawyer is pretty shrewd. He has a trial strategy that works. So in order for the appellate court to judge whether or not he was incompetent, you need to include an affidavit from the lawyer concerning his trial strategy. The appellate lawyer didn't do that. So therefore, the appellate court could not look at this to reverse it. The interesting part about it is that even if the affidavit was included, there probably was not enough mitigating evidence to reverse it. The other factor that I think is interesting and I think needs to be talked about is the fact that where was the plea bargain in this case? I mean, this strikes me as a case that there should have been some talk of something less than death in this man. But when the lawyer is hired to fight and found somebody innocent, sometimes you don't talk about plea bargaining. I'm really wondering, was there an opportunity to plea bargain for something less than death? Was there an opportunity to do life in prison without parole? I'm not sure if this lawyer could even talk about this with the way he was instructed by the family how to handle the case. Okay. So sometimes a lawyer looks bad, but he's hammered by, he's hindered by his client. The trouble is you got to be bigger than your client and you got to control your client. If you can't control your client, you're not the lawyer for that case. Mike, I've asked Jack to talk yeah, about well, that. Well, Susan's dying here. she got a line she wants to get off, Susan. I, okay, but it's very important in this case to understand that it, uh, Ross, in, okay, there was a motion for a psychiatric evaluation to determine competency. That That's what the lawyer filed that and a motion for continuance after guilt or innocence because at that point, uh, Ross f- communicated to his mother and to the lawyers that he did not want the lawyers to put on any witnesses at punishment. And he also communicated to his family that he did not want them to cooperate with the lawyers. And that's why the lawyers put in the motion, filed a motion for a psychiatric evaluation. Did that happen? For competency. Um, that no, the judge denied it. The judge uh, had it's, basically it's up to the discretion of the judge, and the issue on competency is: is the person understand the proceedings against them, and are they able to assist their lawyer and communicate with their lawyer in the defense of their case? The judge had observed him for seven weeks, and the judge saw no, re- you know, didn't see any reason that he he appeared he did not appear to be incompetent to the court. So that probably caused there were other witnesses that might have been willing to testify at the punishment phase of his trial. However, um, such as his sisters, and I think there were a few other people, but Ross was instructing them not to cooperate with the lawyers on that. Okay. Jack, uh, should have this been a capital case in the first place? You know, that's uh, when I was reviewing the facts of this case, I had a real tough time trying to figure out why on earth the prosecutors were seeking the death penalty. Death penalty cases tend to involve defendants who have been in trouble before. They've got a bad background. This isn't their first rodeo. I mean, there there usually is a whole litany of things that suggest this person is, you know, he's really just a bad person. On the other hand, here you've got a you've got a guy who You've got a defendant who really just, its he seems like he pulled himself by, up by the bootstraps. He had you know, good friends. He got a good education, things like that. And it begs the question, why, did this, why was this a capital case? I think it's because it was a, it was a Texas Tech professor who, uh, who was killed. You know, you've got a city like Lubbock. Who was basically a bystander. Yeah, he was a, he was a bystander. Um, I he, mean, there certainly wasn't any motivation on the part of uh, uh, Von Ross to uh, kill a professor. No, it didn't seem that way. But you know, you're dealing with a city of Lu- a city of Lubbock, which is it's uh, it's one of the, you know, it's a big institution in Lubbock, and you can't simply let a, a uh, the the killing of a professor slide. It's uh, you know he was real prominent. He was an associate dean of the library. Um, yeah, I think they. I think the prosecutors really had to uh, really pushed for this one for political reasons. 
It is um, July the 18th, 2003, the date of the death of Vaughn Ross by execution at the hands of the state of Texas. I want to thank uh, the crew for making this possible. I see Doyle over there doing the board with uh, Dewey and Mike uh, hovering over his shoulder. Our producer, Elizabeth Stein, makes all of this possible and has worked very hard to put the show together. Our lawyers are Jim Skelton, Susan Ashley, Larry Douglas, Mike Gillespie, and Jack Lee. They've done a remarkable job this evening. It's a confusing case. It's difficult to deal with cases like this. My name is Ray Hill. In addition to tonight's broadcast on KPFT and executionwatch.org, this a whole show was videotaped, as was the interview with Vaughn Ross, and will be played at a later date on uh, HMSTV.org or on Comcast Channel 17, Houston's Public Access Radio. The producer of that effort is Mark Pirtle, who's um, got his lens trained on me right now. Everything we do is under the tutelage of Otis McClay, who is our technical wizard and keeps our uh, website up and running. <clears throat> the music comes from Victoria Panetti, and you can find out about her at shemonsterinternationalmyspace.com slash shemonster. My name is Ray Hill. Ross Vaughn is dead. Don't you know?